till we got the message it's being oh there's the message telling us that we're being recorded um mm -hmm. thanks everybody for coming along oh someone's got microphones on for horrible Hi. feedback mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um yeah, if you're camera shy and you don't want to be in the recording, I understand having your cameras turned off, but I would much rather have your cameras on. I like to see people's faces when I'm presenting to them rather than black screens or photos. So if any of you who are not camera shy don't mind turning on the cameras, it's so much nicer to actually see who you're talking to when you're presenting. Adam, on that note, I'm seeing you. Nice haircut. Long time no see. All right, so uh, we're going to get started. Thank you all for coming. I'm Rab. My co-presenter is Kauri, who you know about. I'm just very quickly going to share my screen. So I guess everybody can share the screen. So following good presentation practice, all presenters at the beginning should establish their credibility. And they usually waste a lot of time talking about, I've got this credential, that credential, whatever, whatever, whatever. I'm going to skip most of that. My LinkedIn profile, Cowley's LinkedIn profile, they're sent to public. Academia EDU is exactly the same. Research map is the same. Uh, I, we both have Google Scholar profiles. So you've got our names. You've got their little bio already. You can Google us and find it out very, very easy. We're both Google Innovator Award winners, Apple ADE Award winners, blah, blah, blah. You can find out all of that stuff by yourself. So moving on to the second thing that good presenters should do, they should always tell people what's in it for you. Why are you paying attention to this session? Well, as we're all aware, AI has made major inroads into education. It's making it much more challenging to teach writing because students can just subcontract the writing out to AI apps, and we've got no idea if the students have done the writing by themselves or they've done it by an AI app. So we will need to evolve our teaching practices to deal with this reality, just like everybody has to evolve when new technology comes along. Go back thousands of years ago, ancient Greek time, lots of people were against this newfangled technology called writing. It would damage people's memories our memory power would get worse. But obviously there was a trade-off because being able to write enables things to being passed through time, through generations. Nobody would go back to having no writing. Similarly, the Gutenberg printing press. Lots of people were against that. It would open up writing to the masses. The quality of writing would go down. And you know nobody advocates only elites being able to write these days. Well, the arrival of AI has got similarly foundation shaking effects. We need to adapt to deal with it. Now I've heard some teachers talk about, I'm teaching writing, I'm going to have all my students do it with pen and paper in a room to make sure there's going to be no AI usage. Well, I, I don't advocate going as far as that. That would be a backward step. But there are some steps that I'm going to try and cover today about how I would suggest teachers can come up with a process for teaching writing that null, not maybe nullifies or minimizes the amount of AI usage that students can use. So today's session is going to be kind of split into two. Before you can write, you need to research. That involves reading. And first, Calry is going to talk about some different apps and AI apps and how students can use AI apps ethically in a non-plagiaristic way to get their research reading done before they move on to the writing. So all that being said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll let Cowrie take over and she's going to cover the first part on reading to get the research. And then when she's done, I'll come back in and I'll cover the writing part. And then we're going to have a Q&A at the end. Now, chatting to Sarah, um, the best way to handle Q&A, we've decided, is if you've got any questions as things come along, type them up in the chat, and Sarah's going to organise the questions, and we'll go through them at the end of the Q&A time. So I'm going to pass over to Kauri. You're on. Okay, thank you so much, and thank you for the nice introduction and warm welcome. And I'm really happy to be here with you all today. Um, you know, I've never been the most tech-savvy person out there. But I always believed that the right tools can make our work so much um, easier and more efficient. 
So, and that's exactly what I'm here to talk about. And technology and AI in particular has this like incredible power to take us um, to places where we never even dreamed of. So as educators, um, it's our job to not just keep up with the, like the current, you know, like trends and times, but to prepare our students for a future where technology is going to be everywhere. So now um, what AI has been a fantastic tool for me, um, there's something really important like I want to address. Like as educators, our goal isn't just to make things easier for our students and we need to ensure that, you know, they are using these tools responsibly. Like so plagiarism is a big no-no and we need to train our students to use technology ethically. It's not just about avoiding plagiarism though. We also need to think about the bigger picture, the moral implications of using AI in education and you know, and how do we prepare our students for jobs that might not ex even exist yet? Or how do we ensure they're using technology in a way that's ethical and responsible? How can we make them lifelong learners and all that sort of things? Anyway, these are the questions we need to keep in mind as we integrate AI into our teaching. And it's not just about making our lives easier, it's about preparing our students for future that's constantly changing. So let me tell you about this tool that's been a total game changer for me since June last year. Um, it's called Chat PDF. As someone who is an EFL learner and a researcher, um, I can tell you reading um, academic papers in English can be a real challenge, but Chat PDF has made it so much easier to get through those documents and really understand the contents and the message. So um, let me give you a quick demo of how it works. Okay, so I will share my screen. Just a moment. Right here. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. I'll make it bigger. Just a moment. But um, I need... Okay, so I would... Start from the beginning. If you type chatpdf.com and you will get to a website like this. It's a free tool. And it says drop PDF here. So say that you found a good um, research paper or um, I will show you this. Uh, do you, can you see? Okay, um, so this WHO document is 70 pages. I'll just drop the PDF here. Right? And then I just move this over here. So greetings, this helpful PDF file, you know, da, 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 da. And then can you see there are three possible questions here? Okay. So um, imagine you have stack of research papers and documents that you've gathered for your research. And you know, you know, you're thinking of reading them to see if they're useful for your study. And this is where chat PDF comes in handy. So um, first you go to chat PDF, right? You drop your PDF, okay? Even if your document is lengthy, um, chat PDF immediately offers three potential questions, okay? So let me click one of them. Okay, what are the core indicators adopted by the 53 member state of the WHO? Da, 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 da. So I'll click here and add question, and then it will answer. And you can, if you want, you can copy by clicking this, right? But it even tells you where it's discussed. So it says eight, that is page eight. So you click here. And then it will take you to page eight, and this is where it's discussed, right? I've actually highlighted some of the some parts of the PDF, but anyway. So, and if you have a specific question, like it says, ask a question here. So I can say, what are the main findings? Are the findings of this paper? 
and then main findings is da 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 da, and then it gets page four, right? And it's highlighted here, page seven. So you will read this and sort of understand the gist of it, or you can, you know, um, find out if the paper is worth reading. Okay. So and one of the greatest feature of chat PDF is um this chat PDF can speak any language. So language versatility is the strength. So not only can it understand English, but it can also communicate in other languages. So if, for example, in fact, chat PDF can read PDFs and respond to questions in any languages. So if you upload a document in English, and then you still want to ask questions in Japanese, the chat PDF can do that. Um, and it will reply in the language you used for your question. So let's try. <laughs> so can you see? This is one of the weaknesses. So um, when you type in Japanese, as soon as you hit space to change, right, it just sent. So what I do, the turn way around is to type somewhere else like memo and then a word and then copy and paste the whole thing. I don't know if main message is good, but anyway, so it will, if you ask question in Japanese, it will answer in Japanese. Okay, and initial greetings at the beginning here, like greetings, okay. This will be in the language of the PDF, but after that chat PDF will answer in language you ask your questions in. And additionally, chat PDF allows you to organize your documents by creating um, folders. So if you um, want to, if you find the research papers or you know related documents, you can organize them into topics. For example, I just did, for example, aging society. There are two, so like well-being, health and well-being here, right? So you can organize your documents into folder, and even better, if you click aging society, for example, right? I have two documents you can ask one question for all the research papers that's in the same folder. So um, I'll do that again, but um, what, uh, the, sorry, main findings. What are the, that are common to all papers? I only have two at the moment, but it will cover. So the main findings common to all papers are one, two, three, four, right? Okay, so um, now um, I want to be upfront about a few limitations of chat PDF. So one thing is about typing questions in Japanese. So when you want to hit the space, it just, you know, the question will be sent. So I think you better um, type your questions elsewhere and then copy and paste the whole thing, not directly typing in the, you know, space. Yeah. And regarding the uh, reading the images. So currently chat PDF cannot read images in PDFs, including like scan the text. So it can read text in tables but there might be some issues with you know, matching the correct rows and columns and all that. So um, that's one of the limitations. Also, this is just my personal experience, but retention. Um, I found that reading papers with chat PDF didn't stick in my memory, as well as when I used to you know, print them out and annotate them with a fluorescent pen or highlighter and you know, write memos. Um, so to conquer, counter that, this um, I started to jotting down notes in my notebook, um, as well as you know having chat PDF sort of uh, give me the gist of it. 
the language input. And also accuracy, in the ninth month I've been using chat PDF, I encountered one mistake. So it's a reminder that you know, we should always double check the information provided by AI. And despite like these challenges, um, I found chat PDF to be incredibly useful. So have I convinced you of its value? <laughs> um, I hope so. Um, and just to be clear, I'm not receiving any compensation from chat PDF for sharing this with you. But um, speaking of which, um, let's talk about the cost. So cost, chat PDF allows you to use it for free with one you know, email account with two PDFs every day each up to 120 pages. And from more, you can upgrade to Chat PDF Plus for only $35 per year or $5 per month. And with the security, Chat PDF will never share your files with anyone. They are stored on a secure um, cloud storage and they can be deleted at any time. So what do you think? Have I managed to convince you of its value? And I, I'm not here to sell you anything, but I just want to share something that um, made a big difference in my work as a researcher. Now, I would like to introduce another fantastic tool that um, complements chat PDF beautifully. Now, if I train, or when I train my students to use chat PDF, they will start understanding, you know, like reading more research papers. But I've noticed that sometimes students might rely too heavily on it and asking questions in their own language or not fully engaging with the English text. So my goal is to help them improve their reading skills while still reading in English. And that's where Rewordify comes in. So um, let's say you've got this, right? And remember, um, when you click here, you can copy the whole text, right? So I'll copy here, that copy the whole message, right? I go to rewordify.com. I'm sorry, I'll just, just go to rewordify and .com. Okay, rewordify.com. And then you will paste the message, you will paste what you found on chat PDF, okay? And then rewordify text, so you click here, okay? Okay, so can you see? The word in yellow, highlighted in yellow, are the difficult words, for example, I don't think highlight is difficult, but let's see. Okay, so underscore. Okay, the original word was underscore, but then rewordify, replace underscore to highlight. Okay, the study of getting old. Oh, I don't know this. I never heard of this word before. Okay, so... I don't know if you can hear this, but um, anyway, so that's what Rewardify does. So if you go to settings at the top, right, level three, so the Rewardify changed eight words, right? But if you go down to level one, which is the default, there are 35 difficult words that Rewardify replaced. So let's have a look and save and close. And you can even change the highlighting color to you know blue, underline, none or green. Okay. Save and close. So see, um, if depending on the level, rewardify changes, because for example, old, elderly, right? Complete and thorough, through comprehensive, thorough, yeah. Focus on is emphasize on, okay, and things like that. Now, even better, let's look at this. There are 35 hard words. How many do you want to learn? Three, seven, or 10, or hand pick words. So you can encourage students to read it, re, 
use rewordify to make the text easier, but still, you know, encourage them to read English rather than having them use, you know, um, Google Translate or DeepL. So, and I still want them to learn English and to be able to read in English. So see if you, let's say that you click here, right? Okay, so three words, new words to learn, okay? Now, begin learning. So I'll click here, word list to facilitate advocacy for individuals, facilitate, okay? Now you will listen, you will facilitate means, means to help, right? Next. The word. So listen. Now this this part didn't work, Rob. It says listen again. The word. It's the word. Yeah, I had problems with that as well. Recently the sound reading, and maybe there's something wrong with our API for that, but recently the sound part didn't work. Okay. So I just skipped that part. Okay. It works on some students' devices, it doesn't work on others. Okay, thank you. So next step is, look, read this and look for the word facilitate. The word means help. So it's reminding, you know, the students again, it means help. Recommendations for establishing centers for geriatrics and gerontology. It's hard to facilitate. That was the old word that you said oh. you didn't know about study of old people. <laughs> that's right. That's right. To facilitate collaboration after train and training in release regional blocks. So facilitate means to help. Now next type it. So I will type facilitate. Right? Next. Type the word. Type the word without looking. So good job. Now type the word that means help. What was it? Facilitate, right? Facili. And then I'll make a mistake. Facili. Hey. Okay, type the word. I type the word. Try again. So, you know. Okay. So, what does facilitate most closely mean? I'll just make a mistake. Partners. Keep learning. Okay. So, and things like that. So, it will help you learn the new word, right? You can even handpick. And you can do, you know, hear the word list, but you can, you know, decide which word that you want to run. So um, I'll go back. Uh, you can also practice with the flashcards. I wonder if this works. Oh, it doesn't work with mine. Okay, anyway, advocacy for, fighting for, individuals, people. Okay, so you can have, um, encourage students to, um, you know, learn and read in English. So um, I think it complements each other quite well. So um, I think, yeah, that's something that I really encourage my students if they want to develop their English reading skills. It's really important for them to put an effort, extra effort to, you know, read in English instead of, um, you know, using um, Google Translation or DeepL. So I hope, um, you know, you found this demonstration helpful. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to ask or chat, you know, type in chat, but um, we will save that until the end. So now my friend Rob will take over. Thank you so much. Right. Most of the, well, actually all of these links and things that Carly's shown and I'm going to show, we've got a handout with all of these, which I'll share in a moment. So you don't really need to take much in the way of notes. You can sit back and relax. And on that note, let me share my screen again. Okay, so... Cowdy's covered the reading part, you know, the students doing the research, hopefully getting the information into their heads, which is, you know, what we want. And a couple of things about that. She mentioned that when she was reading the chat PDF to, you know, get the information in her head, the memory retention wasn't as good as maybe just sitting down and reading it. And that's something that we mentioned at another conference we were at last week. Um, 
I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the concept of lateral reading. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So traditional reading is focused reading. You know, you turn off everything, tune off everything. You've got a book in front of you, hopefully with a nice glass of whiskey when you're drinking with it, but you're focused on the book and nothing else. And that's really good for getting a deep understanding because all of your processing power is going into understanding this book or, or article, but it's only one thing. It's very narrowly focused. Lateral reading is what we generally do more when we're sitting on the internet. You've got something open in a tab. You start reading it. There's a hyperlink embedded in the document, or there's a concept in the document that you want to know more about. You open a new tab. You open the link in the new tab. You do the search in the new tab, and you start reading that. And then another link comes up to something else, and you end up having six, seven, eight, ten tabs open, and your reading is kind of branching out sideways to get this other information before you come back to the first piece. The good point about this type of reading is the volume of information that goes into your head is much, much, much more, but you retain less because your brain power is spread out from juggling all these different things that you're reading at the same time. You've got the breadth, but not the depth. And, you know, good research should probably use a bit of both of this. So we're not suggesting that in any way that this replaces the focus reading, because we do like having our beer or whiskey as you're reading a book. That should never be discounted, but you should be doing the, you know, this lateral reading as well to get the both coming in. And the point that Cali mentioned is if you want to keep the retention up, take good notes. And, you know, not very AI-ish, but I do recommend Cornell Notes. It's a very, very good system. Too much detail to go into for that today. But, you know, there's a ton of different note-taking apps out there, some of them using AI as well. Use the one that works best for you and take the notes. Now, coming to the writing, we do need to make sure that the students are not using AI in the writing or at least not using it in a plagiaristic way. So what I start off by doing in all my writing classes from the first week, maybe it's a set up, from week two onwards, every one of my students has a homework task from each class. And the homework task, this is for writing classes, the homework task is to write a two-paragraph report on each class. And this paragraph, the first paragraph, they're going to practice report writing. What did we do? Rab did this. We learned this. It's all kind of passive reporting type structures. And the second paragraph is the reflections on what they did. Was it good? Was it bad? Was it interesting, useful, difficult, easy, whatever, whatever, whatever. And these have a number of purposes. Having these two paragraphs from each student, I read them on a regular basis. I use an app called Feedly. Uh, where are we? And I'll show you one of a student who I got, a superstar student, got permission to use her work. Uh, this is an academic writing class. So um, some of you have been to my Zotero workshop before. This was the week I introduced the Zotero writing app to the students. So here's her first paragraph. This is what we did. Here's the second paragraph. Here's her reactions and reflections to what we did. I tell them that I want nice, big, rounded paragraphs following the one three 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 one structure. The first one refers to the first sentence as a topic sentence. The last one refers to the last sentence, which is a concluding sentence. And the three threes in the middle of the three different points in the paragraph, each with three sentences that connect to the topic. So very structural on purpose. We'll come to that later. So first purpose this does I can see what they think we did in the class. And by looking at multiple students here, I can see if they've missed anything, what's not stuck in their memory. And more importantly, in the second one, I can see if it was too difficult, too easy, interesting, boring, or whatever. And that gives me feedback to on the fly change my classes going forwards. That was the main reason why I started doing this. But with the arrival in AI, a secondary benefit came out of this. Because I've then got multiple weeks. Today's class was different than usual. We went to the library, we did a tour, it was good, it was bad, whatever. I've got multiple weeks of these students having these two paragraphs. 
that's a task that AI can't do for them because AI wasn't in my class and didn't see the crazy things that I'm doing week to week to week, having them bound towers out of spaghetti and put marshmallows on the top and all sorts of weird, wonderful writing things that don't seem like they're writing connected, but they are. AI's not in that class. So they can't really use AI to write these two paragraphs. This is a much more realistic example of their writing without AI because of the nature of the assignment. It's their reflections on it. It's their experience, not AI's. So then once we've got this up and running, there's a number of writing tools that I teach the students. Now, some of you are probably familiar with the academic word list. I guess some people have seen this book. These are the 570 head words that make 3,000 total words that students should be using to make their writing seem professional, high level. You know, words that architects, accountants, lawyers, professors, and students should be using. And there's links in here that take you to the Oxford, the Cambridge, sorry, dictionary. You can hear the words spoken in British and American English, get definitions, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to see the students work, you know, how many of these words are going to come up. So if I go back here, let me just choose here. Let's go. My mouse is set to go too fast. Right. So we'll copy my student's text here. And we'll go to this app called LexTutor. Some of you have probably seen this before. And we just paste the text in here and click Submit. And what this does is this tells me of my student's writing, which I just copied here. It color codes it, and it tells me what percentage of her writing is K1 words, the 1,000 most commonly used words in English. In, out, up, down, dog, cat, dog. Simple, easy to use words. What percentage of the K2 words what percentage are from that AWL list I just showed you, and all the rest. So we can see that in her class reporting, she's using a score, of, she's getting a score of 6.6% of these AWL words. Uh, where's Feedly? Where did it go? In her text here. That's a pretty good score. And if we scroll down here, we can actually see which they are draft thesis, effects, specific topic, paragraph. And we can see that they're not hugely repetitive. So that's a good thing as well. Um, I also use the app called Analyze My Writing. Again, has anyone used that before? Same thing. We can paste their text, analyze the text. Tells us how many words, how many sentences, syllables, etc., etc., etc. Boring stuff. The interesting thing is this. How many one-letter, two-letter, three-letter, six-letter, eight-letter words? How many short, medium, and long sentences? And these two metrics, they're used to tell us the readability of her writing. Now, it uses five systems, Gunning Fog, Fleish Kincaid. If you really want to know what these are, you can click on the links. It takes you to the wiki page explaining them. It's out with today's session. And more importantly, it gives us an average of these five because they all work out using a different system. So the average here, that says 12.4. Now, what does that talk about for? What that means is American school system grade 12. So grade one would be like Shogaku Ichinense, first year elementary, grade seven, uh, grade two would be a seven-year-old grade. Two. So basically, if you add six onto this, this is the age of the student how old the student would need to be to understand this writing. So this was saying that an American student would need to be over 18 years old to understand my student's thing here because it's got too many big words that 16, 15, 14 year olds would struggle with. So that gives me a good example, um, I'll just close that down, of the readability of her text And it was 12.14, which is pretty good. Now, we know from here, we can see which are the AWL words. 
It also lets me see if any of them are being overused. So if you took one ALW word and used it 20 times, that would give you a high score that would be undeserved because, you know, you're not really using that range of vocab. You're using one word many times. So we can see how many times words have been used. And they're useful things for me to find out. Um, you don't really need word counter. That just gives you more of a fine tuning over this. Uh, we don't really need story tools, but I put it in here. What that does is gives you a more detailed version of this. It uses eight rather than five systems to give you the average. Um, Paper Rater is like the free version of Grammarly. Grammarly own it, they bought it, it's free. So we can click Use Now Free, paste in my student's text, tell it my student's grade, she's undergraduate, type of paper, uh, it's a kind of article, a blog, it could be an essay, it could be whatever. I agree, and get report. And the longer the text you push in, the longer it's going to take. So it takes between like you know, one, two, maybe three minutes to give us the results. My dog is barking downstairs. Can someone give Cream some water? She's obviously saying she's thirsty. Okay, now it hasn't finished loading yet, but we can start going through these even though it hasn't finished the processing. The only thing we're not going to get is underlining of any issues. So spelling makes a couple of suggestions. Grammar makes a couple of suggestions. Word choice, if there were any casual words, slang words, wherever, it would highlight them. Bad phrase, good phrase, that's just casual writing. It's not academic, so of course it's more on this side. For her actual report, final essay, it was more over here. Transition phrase is very good, furthermore, and moreover, however, these are all good. These are the ones she's used. And there are some other ones that she hasn't used. Um, sentence info, blah, blah, blah. But readability, we don't need because, you know, we get that from here anyway. Yeah. Passive voice, anything that needs to be changed. Variety of sentence starts. Academic word list. Now, that's what we're saying four because this one is less accurate than LexTutor, which is specific for that. And now it's finished loading. If there were any that needs an underlining, it'll come up like that. And at the end, it's going to give us a grade. Now, this is because this is set up for academic writing, and this is just a report. If I actually put in her real essay, she was like 90-something and an A for that. So the point I need to tell them here is this grade doesn't mean their paper is good or bad. It's just a reflection on the quality of the language. They could be writing a beautiful paper on why the world is flat and it would be complete nonsense. Any sailor could tell you that. You see the tops of ships before the bottom in the distance. So I tell them not to get so hung up on this. It's just about their language conventions. So they know how to use all of these apps and they know that I know how to use all of these apps. And I've then got lots of samples of their writing from their blogs before they're let loose on the essay. So when they start writing the essay, um, we can see our essay here. Uh, let me just show you the process I use. Um, I make a document like this, and I put all the students' names in it, and I ask them to choose a big general topic, history, politics, economics, wherever, and a more focused topic under that big umbrella. And every student can see every other student's. And I get them to make groups of two, three, or four people where there's some overlap between their research topic. It's not going to be two people exactly the same, but there's a little bit of overlap, and they become their writing partners. And we then write using the ePortfolio system this is my own document. Again, the link is here. I'll stick it in the chat. If you want to get your own copy of this, this will give you viewing of that. Chat. There's the link to this ePortfolio. So I've got some further links in here to the Purdue Writing Center. I also give them links to these apps that we very, very quickly gone over. 
And then we get on to the pre-writing work. I ask them to, again, put in their big topic, their more focused topic, and what's the argument? Because there has to be an argument for academic writing. Someone says X, someone says Y, which is more likely to be right. And then what's their position? And then I have them go through what I call the five A's. This is my own idea. They need to prove to me that that's an academic topic. So they can't be writing about Disney because they like Mickey Mouse. But they could look at how Disney uses Mickey Mouse in their marketing and how Sanrio uses Hello Kitty and do a comparative to see which is the best, the most efficient. Now you've got a comparative business paper. So I want to see that they've got it set up academic in nature. I want to see that there's an argument, argument here. You know, you can't write an academic paper that we need air to live because, you know, the, who says we don't? There's no counter argument. And it needs to be accessible. And this means they have to be able to find English language documents that they can access. The topic has to be achievable within a semester, however many paragraphs, five paragraphs, 10 paragraphs, you're expecting them to write. They're never going to cover rise and fall of the Roman Empire in 2,000 words. The topic is too big. And they have to show that it's attractive by showing that in current times, people are still interested in this topic. Then I have them develop a research question we try and hash out a title, develop a three-part, three-reason thesis. Japan should stop or should continue using nuclear power because reason one, reason two, reason three. And we then come up with a working plan, an outline of the paper. I then ask them to go and find some resources, places where they can find sources, and then find specific sources, and then they're ready to start writing. Now, it's possible they could have used AI to help them generate the sources. That's okay. I don't mind them doing that. Then they'll write a draft one. And the writing team members will use the comment function to give some comments on it. And then they'll write an improved draft two a week later. And then their team members will give more comments. And then they'll end up, hopefully, with a super duper draft three. Then we move on to the body section. Same thing. They write a draft one, get some comments, improve it based on the comments, get more comments, write a draft three. And we go through this for each of the sections until we finish. Then they can copy and paste all the third drafts into the full length draft. And then they look at the peer review checklist, layout, title, spacing, body sections, does it have the right topic sentence? Does it have the right structure? Does the conclusion do what it's supposed to do? And the feedback that they get on this from their partners helps them write a better second draft. And then we use Turnitin. I've got access to Turnitin, and we check that for plagiarism. And then we have the final draft, which is the one that I look at. Now, when I'm going looking through all of this, um, so here's Marinas, one of my students, a superstar student. So here's her first draft. Now, her team members, they're all used to Microsoft Office. None of them were very up to speed on Google. They didn't realize you can highlight something and stick a comment in here. So on that first draft, they actually emailed her their comments. And then I showed them, you know, that you can actually use the comment function. And then their team members, I think the hook is good, blah, 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 blah. Then they started to give all the comments running down the spine of the document. So we can see it improving based on each other's comments. And, you know, then we get to the end and, you know, we've hopefully got the very, very good paper. And if we've got the very, very good paper, I look at this and the quality of this matches the quality of the free course week one, week two, week three, two paragraphs, there's no problem. Now, this is really fantastic writing. She's an amazing student, and her writing every week was really, really good. Amazing, fantastic student. There's no alarm bells go off in my head. However, what if there was a piece of text, and I was suspicious that this, this is just my own writing. This text was suspicious in that it was much, much, much better, higher metrics, higher scores than any of these other things. Then what I would do is I would copy that text. And I don't have money, to, I don't have a budget yet to spend on apps. 
turn it in, you used to have an AI checker built in, and they stopped it at the end of last year. Now, if you want to turn it in to have the AI checker, your university has to pay extra for it, and almost all the universities I know haven't paid extra for it, so I don't have access to that. So I found a free one, Copy Leaks. It's a, an extension you can add into your Google Chrome, and I just paste the text in here. Did a human write this? Ta -da! Human text, because it was me. I'd be really surprised if it said AI generated because I knew I wrote it and it's my own writing. So I wouldn't 100% trust this. I wouldn't fail a student just because that said AI generated, but that would set alarm bells going off. And in some of my classes last semester just finished, there were two students that did have AI generated, AI generated. Now I failed those students. Now the reason was not because this said AI generated, that was just the icing on the cake that my failed decision was correct. The reason was these students didn't have a draft one, a draft two, a draft three. They just had a draft three. It had no comments. There's no clue where this text came from. And I used something called draft back, which is another Google Docs extension. Now this will take a bit of time to load. So I already, here's one I prepared earlier. This is the document. When you hit, if you've installed Draftback, you need to have editing power to make it to work. And I have, and I hit it. And then when I go play, you can see the text coming up, typing deletions exactly as the student made it. And you can see the timestamp on it. Now this dates from 2020, because that's when I wrote this latest version of my ePortfolio. And you can see all the type, typing deletions wherever. You can speed it up, slow it down. You can click graphs and statistics, and you can see when it was done, how often it was done, and whatever. So that enables me to check the student's writing that it was done regular and often. So if we go back to my superstar students one, and we click file and we go to version history, you're not going to see anything useful because I made a copy of her paper and deleted all the identifying things except for her first name. So it only shows a couple of changes. That would be a bad one because, hey, where's all the work leading up to this? But on a real student's portfolio, and I know hers because I've seen it, I could see there were changes every day, multiple changes every day, that's a good way to approach the writing a little and often. And I can see that coming through by using this approach. So this particular approach, it's kind of AI resistant in that you can see the steps that I went through to ensure the students write the paper correctly. You can see the steps that I go through to check it, turn it in, check the plagiarism, um, the revision history lets me see that they've been doing it on a regular basis. Copy leaks gives me some feedback on whether AI has been used. And both myself and Kauri were waiting on the results of a CACN research grant. We'll hopefully get a good result in a week, fingers crossed, fingers crossed. So if that comes through, we'll have more money to spend on some of the other apps that allow us to check AI usage and plagiarism, which is what we want to do under the CACN proposal. So that's the system, essentially, that we go through. Now, if your university doesn't have Google Classroom and Google Institutional stuff, then I use my students' private Gmail accounts and they make a blog and I just check the reflections on the blog. But if you're my main university, Recio, we are fully on board with Google. We've got access to Google Classroom. So I can just create the two paragraph reviews every week in Google Classroom. And I don't need to do it on a blog. The only difference is on the blog, the blogs can be opened up to their classmates so they can see each other, see their writing styles and whatever. And that's a good writing for me rather than writing for me approach. But we also set the blogs to private so that search engines won't find them, only their classmates will find them. If you do it on Google Classroom, you can't do that. On Google Classroom, the only person that can read their reflections is the teacher, unless the Google document that they submit, they also share it with their team members. So they need to do that extra step. 
So that's about as much as I wanted to go through with the systems that, that we're using. Um, I think this is probably a good time to move on to Q&A. We've got about 10 minutes left, I guess. 